To outline today's event, the webinar in its entirety will run approximately two hours, which includes Q&A panels. And if you have questions now or during the webinar, please enter those questions into the Q&A chat pod. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. It's our pleasure to welcome our speakers. First, we welcome Dr. Anurata Ramamurthy, Policy Lead, Guidance and Policy Team, Office of Clinical Pharmacology, Office of Translational Sciences in CEDAR, to present on the evaluation of gastric pH change mediated DDIs with acid reducing agents. And you'll be joined by Dr. Shinning Yang, Policy Lead, Guidance and Policy Team, Office of Clinical Pharmacology and the Office of Translational Sciences, CEDAR. This will lead us into our first Q&A panel. Please join me to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Ramamurthy. Hello, everyone. A warm welcome to this session. As a quick introduction, my name is Anuradha Ramamurthy. I'm a master scientist and policy lead in the guidance and policy team, in, which is within the Office of Clinical Pharmacology, CEDAR FDA. I'm here today with my colleague, Dr. Shining Yang, who is also a policy lead from the Guidance and Policy team. Thank you for joining us today for the SBIA webinar session on the guidance for the industry titled Evaluation of Gastric pH Mediated Drug-Drug Interactions with Acid-Reducing Agents. And we'll be talking about study design, data analysis, and clinical implications. This is a final guidance that was published earlier this year in March of 2023. This addresses comments submitted to the draft guidance, which was published in December 2020. Before we take a look at the guidance in depth, I'd like to acknowledge and thank the working group members and the subject matter experts who have contributed to this guidance. This guidance also relies extensively on the collective experience of the OCP review staff, and we'd like to acknowledge them as well. This guidance describes FDA's recommendations regarding when a clinical study with acid reducing agents are needed for, to, in order to evaluate drug-drug interaction, the design of such clinical DDI studies, how to interpret these study results, and how to communicate these findings in drug product labeling. This slide here outlines the table of contents that cover the various topics that I just mentioned. But before we look at when the studies are needed, let us understand why pH-dependent drug-drug interaction studies are important in order to evaluate and mitigate any concerns for drug interactions. Acid-reducing agents are commonly used medications that treat certain gastrointestinal diseases or conditions. While some of these drugs are available through prescription, others are available over the counter. The most commonly used acid-reducing agents include antacids, which are short-acting, histamine receptor antagonist or H2 blockers, which are intermediate-acting, and proton pump inhibitors, which are long-acting. These acid-reducing agents lower the level of stomach acid and they consequently elevate gastric pH. This can affect the solubility and dissolution of some orally administered drugs that may be susceptible to changes in gastric pH. And as a result, the bioavailability of the drug could be altered because of this concomitant administration with acid-reducing agents. And this could potentially result in loss of efficacy for weak-based drugs or increased adverse events for weak acid drugs. Now, let's look at when clinical DDI studies with acid-reducing agents should be conducted. Upon 
Sponsors should assess the potential for pH-dependent drug-drug interaction for an investigational drug early in drug development so as to better inform the sub subsequent drug development program, especially for those indications where there is a significant proportion of patients who are likely to be taking these acid-reducing agents. In general, if the drug is determined to have a potential for pH-dependent drug-drug interaction, the sponsor should conduct a clinical study to characterize the effect of acid-reducing agents on the pharmacokinetics of the investigational drug. Alternatively, the sponsors could provide rational justifying a lack of pH-dependent drug-drug interaction based on in vitro, in silico, or clinical studies. product types are discussed in the guidance. The first category is immediate release product of weak base drugs. This is a category with which we have the most experience and the framework that I will be presenting next is for weak base drugs. The second category is immediate release products of weak acid drugs. Our experience is limited with weak acid drugs in general, the magnitude of pH-dependent drug interaction for weak acid drugs is small. It is possible that co-administration with a proton pump inhibitor or H2 blocker could result in higher Cmax or AUC of the weak acid drug. Whether to conduct a clinical study will depend on the safety profile or exposure safety relationship of the investigational weak acid drug. The third category is the modified release products. There is limited experience with clinical pH dependent DDI evaluation for modified release products. Modified release products with pH sensitive release mechanisms can have the potential for drug interaction with acid reducing agents. Sponsors should consult appropriate review divisions for drugs that have modified release profile that can have a pH-dependent drug interaction liability. Here is the snapshot of the framework that can be used to evaluate the risk for pH-dependent drug-drug interaction. This is for immediate release products of weak-based drugs. The potential for an investigational drug to have an interaction with an acid-reducing agent can be assessed in a stepwise manner based on the physical chemical properties of the drug substance and dissolution profiles of the drug product. I'll walk us next through each of these steps. It starts with asking the question, if the investigational drug has a pH-dependent solubility in the relevant physiologic pH range. It's important to characterize the solubility profile of the drug substance over this physiologically relevant pH range of, for example, say pH 1 to 6.8. If the answer is no, then the drug is unlikely to have clinically relevant drug interaction with the acid-reducing agents. Now let's focus on the right side. If the answer to the initial question was yes, that the investigational drug does have a pH-dependent solubility, then the next question becomes, if the investigational drug solubility at pH 6 to 6.8 is less than dose divided by 250 ml? If the answer is yes, then the drug is likely to have an interaction with acid-reducing agents, and a clinical study is recommended. Certain alternative approaches can also be utilized, and Dr. Yang will talk about it shortly. An additional optional step in the process is when the sponsors can compare the dissolution profile of the investigational drug product at different media conditions. If the similarity factor, or F2, is less than 50, then the drug is likely to have interaction with acid-reducing agents and a clinical study is recommended. However, if the drug solubility at pH 6 to 6.8 is not less than dose divided by 250 ml, or 
if F2 is greater than 50, then the uh, during the dissolution profile comparison, then the drug is unlikely to have clinically relevant interactions with acid reducing agents. Now let's talk about some additional factors to consider here. First one is solubility. It is important to characterize the aqueous equilibrium solubility profile of the drug substance over that physiologically relevant pH range of 1 to 6.8. The dose used to calculate the reference solubility, that is the dose divided by 250 ml, should be the maximum recommended therapeutic dose that's intended to be marketed. Next, formulation and dose used in dissolution test. The initial formulation can be used early in drug development to help assess the liability for pH-dependent drug interactions. In addition, dissolution tests should also be performed and reported for formulation that are intended to be marketed at the time of approval. That is the maximum therapeutic dose intended to be marketed. The third consideration ties to food, and this applies to drugs intended to be taken only under fed conditions. Gastric pH is elevated upon food intake. For a drug that is intended to be taken under fed condition, the impact of gastric pH change should be evaluated by comparing solubility and dissolution profiles at conditions representing the fed state pH conditions to that of pH 6 to 6.8. With that, I'll pass this on to Dr. Yang to discuss study design considerations as well as interpretation and communication of the results. Thank you. Thanks, Anu. In the next couple of slides, I will talk about the design and the conduct of clinical DDI studies. The studies generally can be conducted in healthy subjects. When there are safety concerns to preclude the use of a healthy subject, studies should be conducted in patients. The number of subjects should be sufficient to allow a reliable estimate on the magnitude and the variability of the results. Crossover study design is often used and preferred because it reduces the impact of between subject variability on the results. When a drug has a very long half-life, a parallel study design can be considered. In terms of the choice of acid-reducing agent, ARA, proton pump inhibitors, PPI, are generally preferred because they are longer pharmacodynamic effect and also they are widely used by patients than other ARAs. When a PPI is used, a pretreatment period of four days or more is needed to reach the steady state of its pharmacodynamic effect before the administration of an investigational drug. Because a PPI effect is a long lasting, it's not expected that a staggered dosing of PPI with an investigational drug can mitigate a PFDI risk. In contrast, the H2 blocker has a relatively shorter duration effect on gastric pH. Thus, a staggered dosing with H2 blocker may be studied as a strategy to mitigate a PFDI effect. For example, investigational drug can be given two hours before H2 blocker and 10 to 12 hours after actual blocker, and this strategy can be studied in the clinical DDI study. Anti-acid can also be considered as has a shorter duration on gastric pH change. When considering which ARA is used, we need to pay attention to avoid the ARA that can affect the other mechanisms. For example, omeprazole inhibits CYP2C19 if an investigational drug is mainly metabolized by CYP2C19, omeprazole should not be used because the inhibition of CYP2C19 may confound the results due to gastric pH change. Similarly, cimetidine is well known to inhibit multiple CYP enzymes. In addition, it also inhibits the renal transporter MID1 and MID2K. When this transporter play an important role in the PK of an investigational drug, cimetidine should be replaced by other ARAs. We know that the PHDDI effect can be formulation development. 
Therefore, the Tupimaki did the formulation of an investor drug is recommended for the clinical DDI study. However, it's recognized that such a formulation may not be available during early drug development, and it's helpful to evaluate the PLDDI effect earlier. So if a study is performed with an early formulation, justification should be provided on why the results obtained can be extrapolated to the to be marketed formulation if a, a further study is not planned. In terms of a dose, for investor drug, to reflect the, the worst case scenario, is the highest dose intended for therapeutic use should be studied. And for ARA, is the highest dose that is commonly used in clinical practice should be studied. For example, 40 mg for isomeprazole or 40 mg for omeprazole. For drugs that can be taken regardless of a food, the PRDDI study should be done under fasting condition because this likely represents the worst case scenario. For investor drug to be taken with food, study should be conducted under the fight condition that are consistent with late phase clinical trials. It should be noted that a high fat meal may not represent a worst case scenario because it elevates the baseline gastric pH more than other types of meals. In addition, high fat meal stimulate the secretion of a more, uh, more well acid than other type of food and well acid can help solubilize the drugs. PK sampling time should be sufficient to adequately categorize the AUC infinity or AUC tall at a steady state after multiple dose, Cmax and Tmax. And sometimes, if clinical relevant, also the c or partial AUC of the investigation drug. It's useful to also measure active metabolite concentrations if the metabolites uh, contribute substantially to efficacy or safety of investigation drug. As I mentioned earlier, a health approach can also be used to evaluate PHDDI. One approach is a population pharmacokinetic or PK approach. The general consideration for this approach has been described by other FDA guidance on population PK. There are several things need to be pay attention to when applying this approach to evaluate PRDDI. One is a record of dosing information. Because the PRDDI effect can be affected by the timing of administration of an investor drug relative to ARA and can also be affected by food intake, it is important to have a prospective plan to ensure the relevant information is accurately captured. For example, the dose duration and the timing of uh, administration of an investor drug uh, and the ARA, as well as uh, food intake and the types. Because PHDDI effect mainly affect the drug absorption, it is important uh, to include the blood sampling during the absorption phase of an investor drug uh, to better capture the potential P uh, DDI effect. Once the results become available, during data analysis, it is appropriate to evaluate the effect of ARA by different classes. That is, use PPI, H2 blocker, and anti-acid as a three separate covariates instead of simply lump this together. This is because the gastric PID effect of PPI, H2 blocker, and anti-acid have different durations as described earlier. Another approach is a physiology-based PK, PPPK approach. It can sometimes use to evaluate PHDDI risk can, can, and can also used to inform the design of a clinical study. The application of PPPK in this field is still evolving and continuously being evaluated by the FDA. So companies are encouraged to consult the appropriate review division if they pursue PPK approach to evaluate PLDDI risk. In the next couple of slides, I will talk about extrapolating clinical DDI study results and the implication for labeling recommendations. Generally, clinical DDI study results 
with an ARA can be extrapolated to other ARA within the same class. For example, from one PPI to other PPI at those levels that achieve a similar gastric pH elevating effect. Extrapolation of the finding with one ARA to other in-class ARA may be confounded when a dedicated DDI study is conducted with an ARA that has a multiple interacting mechanism besides a change in gastric pH, such as omeprazole can inhibit CYP2C19, cimetidine inhibit multiple CYP enzyme, as well as some transporters as described earlier. A framework is to be presented below um, to extrapolate uh, the result from a dedicated study to support uh, labeling recommendation. This framework uh, describes a situation where an uh, immediate release uh, product of uh, a weak base investigative drug is conducted uh, with a uh, uh, PPI. Because a uh, PPI's effect is uh, long lasting, uh, negative results uh, indicate uh, lack of uh, PLDDI risk of uh, investigative drug. Whether the results uh, can be considered as a clinical significant or insignificant is determined based on the exposure response relationship or dose response relationship of an investor drug. If the results uh, is uh, considered a clinical significant uh, change, it has uh, several implications for labeling recommendation. One is to recommend uh, awarding use of investor drug with uh, PPI. Some companies uh, can conduct a further study to evaluate a lower dose of a PPI since it is possible that uh, there may be dose-dependent effect of a PPI. For actual blocker, it's also recommended to avoid use with actual blocker, and companies uh, can conduct a further study to evaluate uh, one or more staggered dosing scheme to identify a clinical practical uh, dosing regimen to mitigate the PIDDI effect when given with actual blocker. For antacid, it's recommended a staggered dosing of US drug with antacid, that is, an administered drug to or before or after antacid. This is because the effect of antacid on gastric pH change is short term. And the companies can also consider to evaluate a different staggered dosing regimen with antacid. So lastly, uh, let's uh, go over one uh, question. It is asked a uh, concomitant administration of a drug uh, with an acid-reducing agent could alter the bioavailability of the drug, potentially resulting in a loss of uh, efficacy or increased uh, adverse uh, events. Common classes of ARA of concern include A, antiacid, B, H2 blocker, C, proton pump inhibitor, D, all of the above. Well, uh, most of you probably got this correct. The right answer is uh, all of the above. Now let's move to the panel discussion. Thank you everyone for your attention. Thank you for the great presentation. We'll now transition into our Q&A session panel. As a reminder, if you haven't had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. We'd like to welcome to the Q&A panel Dr. Fang Wu, Senior Pharmacologist, Division of Quantitative Methods and Modeling, Office of Research and Standards in the Office of Generic Drugs, and Dr. En Suk Kim, Master Scientist, in the Division of Inflammation and Immune Pharmacology, Office of Clinical Pharmacology, and the Office of Translational Sciences, CEDAR. Looks like we have a few questions that are already starting to roll in. The first group of questions will be directed to Dr. Ramamurthy. And here is the first question. Does the framework for assessing clinical DDI risk for ARAs apply to weak acid drugs? Thank you for the question. It's a very important question. 
as we discussed, um, we have the most experience with weak-based drugs. And the framework that was presented just shortly, as well as what's in the guidance, is based on data and analyses from weak-based drugs. Compared to weak-based drugs, we have limited experience with weak acid drugs, while the majority of weak acid drugs may show little to no change in uh, the concentrations in the presence of proton pump inhibitors or H2 blockers, the drug interaction potential can also vary by the mechanism of interaction for the different weak acid drugs and the type of ARA that may be co-administered. For example, if we take antacids, antacids can form chelation products with some weak acid drugs, and that could result in decrease in drug concentrations. While this is out of scope for the guidance per se, it is an important con uh, consideration during designing any of the studies. And from our limited experience from weak acid drugs, the prediction algorithm that works for weak-based drugs has limited prediction accuracy and may not work well for weak acid drugs. So whether to conduct a clinical study um, will be dependent on the safety profile of the investigational uh, weak acid drug and also its um, exposure safety relationship. So this essentially becomes a case-by-case -case determination uh, that will have to be made. And so we encourage the sponsors to consult the review divisions uh, in such situations. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have another question for Dr. Robert Murthy, and it is the following. Can we use H2 blockers for clinical pH DDI studies instead of PPIs? Again, uh, thank you for that question. That's also a very interesting question. Uh, we usually recommend studies to be con conducted with proton pump inhibitors because they are more commonly used as well as uh, the PD effect um, for proton pump inhibitors uh, last longer. And so we uh, this could represent the worst case scenario. And uh, a negative result uh, from a dedicated study with proton pump inhibitor uh, generally can indicate a lack of pH dependent in drug interaction for the investigational drug, like what Dr. Yang uh, showed us during presentation. H2 blockers can be used for clinical studies when the studies are designed appropriately uh, because the peak effect on gastric pH is not reached immediately after the administration of H2 blockers. H2 blockers can be given ahead of the investigational drug, for example, say two hours prior to the investigational drugs. And really the results of the study will determine what recommendations can be provided for that particular investigational drug with respect to if it can be co-administered with H2 blockers or um, other types of acid reducing agents. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving up to the top of our panel, we have a few questions that came in for Dr. Shenning Yang. And here is the first question for Dr. Yang. If food intake does not affect the concentrations of a drug, does that indicate no interaction by ARAs? Yeah, sure. That's a, a very good question. Uh, can, can you hear me? Yes, please go ahead. Okay, yeah. Well, you know, uh, although food effect uh, uh, elevate uh, uh, gastric pH for um, for a period, um, but, uh, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that uh, when an investor drug uh, is uh, 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 when, I mean, uh, when uh, food effect does not have a that does not that there's no significant food effect, then you know we can uh, uh, use that to to replace a uh, uh, pHDI study. Uh, actually, there are some uh, uh, clinical DDI studies showing that uh, some drug, uh, when even when they, uh, they were taken with uh, uh, food, 
their exposure was uh, still reduced uh, by uh, PPIL I2 blocker to some extent. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a few more questions for Dr. Yang. And here's the next question. Can efficacy data be used as an alternative approach to justify lack of a PHDDI with ARAs? Yeah, this is another good question. Um, I think in uh, principle, it could be, we could leverage clinical data as justification. Um, but there are some uh, nuances uh, uh, when you know analyze uh, that data uh, because in general, you know, efficacy data is uh, more noisy or you know less sensitive compared to PK data, um, and also uh, when analyze that, uh, we need a, a good record of um, uh, the administration of the drug and uh, the ARA. You know, for example. For how long time the RA uh, was uh, used by uh, patients is uh, throughout uh, the, the the trial, or it's only during a certain period of the study, and then you know when the study uh, the clinical endpoint uh, were measured, you know so how how you know that may be affected by relative to the ARA administration time, how likely that was affected by ARA. So it's uh, not uh, so straightforward. It can be used, but. Uh, did there did need to be some sort of analysis of the data? Thank you for responding to that question. A few more questions for Dr. Yang. And the next question is the following. For drugs that act locally within the GI tract and are not absorbed, is it still needed to evaluate a pH DDI risk? Um, yeah, I think it, uh, the answer will be yes for those drugs uh, with mechanism of action that may be affected by gastric DI change. Uh, for example, uh, for some uh, ion vendors, uh, you know, the, uh, we may ask a company to submit an in vitro date first to uh, evaluate the binding potential uh, with the target ion under different uh, pH. And the binding potential with uh, commonly used uh, co medications under the several pH conditions. Uh, in addition, we also need to pay attention to whether those drugs uh, may affect the gastric pH and then affect the other drugs. Thank you for responding to that question. We have one final question for Dr. Yang in this round. And here's the question If the clinical PKDDI study shows a decrease in the Cmax of greater than 25%, but less than 30 or 40%. How do we evaluate whether the clinical significant, significance of this DDI is weak or moderate, similar to what is done for enzyme-based DDIs? Dr. Yang, we're not hearing you on that. We're going to go on oh, to sorry. our next panelist. Oh, oh uh, Please, so, sorry. Uh, do you mind repeating the question again? Yes, I'll repeat the question. If the clinical PK DDI study shows a decrease in the CMAX of greater than 25%, but less than 30 or 40%, how do we evaluate whether the clinical significance of this DDI is weak or moderate? similar to what is done for enzyme-based DDIs. Oh, sure, yeah. So the clinical significance, um, uh, ideally, is to be derived from um, the exposure response uh, analysis uh, based on, uh, you know, the PK and the clinical data from uh, phase two and uh, phase three trials. Um, well, in general, uh, I think uh, people tend to uh, believe that uh, the exposure for majority of the drug is driven by AOC or uh, average concentration. Um, CMAX um, uh, may matter more for uh, drugs that uh, uh, has to show some immediate uh, effect, like uh, you know, uh, uh, some drug to treat uh, uh, as acute treatment of pain, pain relief. 
So as for the uh, magnitude, we don't uh, uh, use the same one as for the enzyme-based uh, uh, DDI. Um, the enzyme-based DDI is uh, often used to help uh, extrapolate from uh, 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 one drug to a number of other drugs. So here, yeah, we also do extrapolation, but it's extrapolation to much limited number of, uh, uh, of ARAs. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist. A few more questions came in for Dr. Fang Wu. Here's the first question for Dr. Wu. When assessing solubility over a physiological pH range, is it necessary to consider solubility at pH as low as 1? And would assessing solubility of, at pH of 1.6 can simulated gastric fluid be adequate to assess the lower pH range since pH range of 1.6 is similar to physiological conditions? Thank you for that question. Uh, we recommend uh, using pH 1 to uh, pH 6.8 for evaluation because that's referred to the um, uh, nine guideline. Uh, the BCS uh, uh, guideline uh, for the uh, uh, the physiological uh, pH range. Uh, however, you can also consider the bio-relevant uh, uh, the conditions uh, like a pH 1.6 uh, if you have provided the justifications and also mimicking the uh, in vivo situation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Wu, for responding to the question. We have a couple more questions, and here is the next question. Could you please elaborate more on the utility of dissolution data as an optional step to assess clinical DDI risk with ARAs? Thank you for the question. Um, yes, according to the framework in the guideline, in addition to use a clinical dose and solubility dissolution comparison at different media conditions may be used as optional step to assess this pH-dependent DDI risk. For example, compare dissolution profiles of the drug product at different media conditions at pH 1.2 versus pH 6.8 for facet condition and use similarity factor F2 less than 50 to predict positive DDI. Based on our research on the data collected from 65 approved new molecular entities, the prediction accuracy using the solution profile comparison actually were comparable to the prediction using solubility and the clinical dose. That's why we uh, keep it as an optional approach. Um, also, please note that will appropriate with justification other dissolution parameters, for example, uh, different apparatus, speed, and bioreligion media can be selected based on the properties of the drug substance and the product, which may, may make better the in vivo situation. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Wu is the following. How does this pH-dependent DDI topic apply to generic drug development? Thank you for the question. For generic drugs, uh, when there are formulation-dependent gastric pH-mediated DDI, additional B studies in subjects with altered gastric pH may be needed. For example, when ROD and the test product contain different levels of pH stabilizing or modifying excipients, high risk of having different degree of pH-dependent DDI exists. In such situation, an additional fasting BE study in the presence of ARA could be recommended for generic drug product. One example is uh, a recently published product-specific guidance for pulp-cyclic oral tablets, uh, which recommends three in vivo BE studies, including fasting fat and fasting BE study in the presence of ARA agent, ARA. Similar to what we have discussed, um, to demonstrate that a BE study in the gastric pH alter situation may not be needed um, using scientific justification, including pH solubility profile, comparative dissolution testing, and multiple pH, and the PBPK modeling may be used. Thank you. 
Thank you for responding to that question. We have one final question for Dr. Wu. And uh, it's a combination question where we'll ask it to Dr. Wu first, and we'll have Dr. Wu pass over to Dr. Shinning Yang for uh, additional comments. And here is the question. What are the utility of PBPK modeling for assessing the pH-dependent DDI risk? Um, thank you for the question. PBPK modeling has been evolving. In conjugation with the assessment framework uh, we outlined in the guide, guidance, PBPK simulations can sometimes be used to further assess the potential for pH-dependent DDI. We have seen that PBPK modeling and simulation were used to justify the lack of pH-dependent DDI risk. However, the case examples are limited. Uh, we internally also conduct a research we developed the PBPK model for four weak base drugs, uh, including one BCS class one drug, Tapentado, and two BCS class two drugs, um, Darunavir and Lorotinib, and one BCS class three drug, uh, Saxagliptin. Um, by using the pH solubility profiles as model inputs, we were able to use these validated PBPK models to qualitatively predict pH dependent DDI by changing the gastric pH to six. For, but for quantitative prediction of the magnitude of positive pH-dependent DDI, further research is needed. It is expected with appropriate input, like using clinical relevant solubility or, and, uh, or dissolution data as model input, and, and, and with the sufficient validation for PBPK model, and then the model may be able to quantitatively predict pH-dependent DDI. If the applicant would like to pursue a PBPK simulation approach to evaluate pH-dependent DDI and have questions, early communications with FDA are encouraged. Thank you. Yeah, I totally agree with what Wang, Wang just said. Um, I think here, you know, it's an important thing is um, the dissolution data because that's the foundation for for this uh, pH-dDI. Um, so you know, it's important to obtain. Um, Dissolution data, you know, try to mimic the uh, in vivo situation. It's not uh, so easy, but uh, um, I think that's uh, the the, um, the the important, very important input for the model. Thank you both. Moving to that question, moving on to our next panelist, we do have a few questions that came in for Dr. Enzo Kim, and here is the first question for Dr. Kim. What considerations should we give when selecting PPIs for gastric pH-dependent DDI studies? Can you hear me? Okay, thank you for the question. So basically all PPIs are expected to increase the gastric pH above four. So therefore, if your drug's solubility changes in the pH range above four, any PPIs can be used for a clinical or DDI study. We recommend that the highest commonly used therapeutic dose of the chosen PPIs to be used to test the clinically relevant worst case scenario because there are multiple indications for different doses approved for the each PPIs. However, most importantly, the DDI potential uh, via different uh, me um, pathway like a zip enzyme or a transporter mediated um, DDI potentials are different among the PPIs. So that has to be really considered. So you should really select a PPI that has no or least DDI potential via other mechanisms to test the impact of gastric pH change by PPIs on PK of your investigation withdrawal. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kim, for responding to that question. We do have one more question for you, and it is the following. What are potential labeling implications of positive gastric pH drug-drug interactions? Right. It's very important, you know, the, all the reason why we are doing these studies are to properly inform the labeling. So, you know, especially the dosing instruction can be quite restrictive if there is a, a positive gastric pH at DDI potential. You know, depending on the data, maybe it has to be given certain way. Staggered dosing with uh, HD blockers should be recommended in the label to minimize the impact of the um, you know, PK in interactions. And oftentimes, depending on the 
um, the therapeutic index of the drug, the, the impacting drug, the co-administration of gastric acid reduced can be contraindicated if the risk of safety or loss of efficacy in such a case, like a, such as like an anti-cancer drug or anti-HIV product is significant. In such a case, you know, clinically, you know, alternative drug may be needed to um, consider it if the co-administration with gastric acid reducer cannot be avoided in specific uh, patient. Thank you. Thank you for responding to those questions. Moving up to the beginning of our panel, we have a few more questions that came in for Dr. Shining Yang. And here is the first question. H. pylori can affect gastric pH. Should H. pylori status of enrolled subjects be considered? And should subjects that are H. pylori positive be excluded from these studies, noting that this would impair recruitment at about 50% of the pop, as about 50% of the population is H. pylori positive. Yeah, it's a, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, it, it's a good practice to in the protocol, you know, specify things that uh, exclude uh, uh, subjects with uh, uh, H. pylori uh, because, you know, the gastric HB sign level is different. Uh, the effect of uh, PIDDI is different. Uh, uh, as to, you know, if a 50% of the population is uh, probably positive, in that case, uh, I would think uh, uh, it will be uh, useful to evaluate the effect in the uh, patient population because there is uh, uh, quite a significant uh, population has that infection. Uh, but I think in general, uh, for majority of uh, the indications, uh, this uh, won't, uh, you know, apply. Thank you for responding to that question. The next question for Dr. Yang is the following. In addition to testing staggered administration of an H2 antagonist and investigational drug, is it an option to offset the ARA impact by administering in drug with an acidic solution? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. Uh, yeah, there have been uh, some uh, studies conducted uh, previously uh, by uh, you know seeking to see whether uh, take off of, of acidic uh, you know a uh, uh, beverage can help uh, uh, mitigate the PHDI effect. Uh, based on the limited number of uh, uh, clinical DDS study reported, uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it's not. Um, so it depends on the the purpose. Uh, if a company want to explore that, uh, you know, yeah, it's uh, you know worthwhile to uh, accumulate uh, more knowledge for. But uh, um, th there are some further consideration of whether you know uh, uh, this translated to clinical practice as to like uh, you know how much uh, the beverage you need to to take to drink. So it has to be well the the de design and defined. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have a couple more questions. Here's the next question: If an interaction is shown lower dose for this for Dr. Yang. Understanding that will affect labeling and do you have, do you still have to conduct ARA study at a higher dose? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I interpreted it as a, uh, the, the investor drug, you know, it's uh, evaluated with a lower dose, but maybe later on, uh, higher dose is also pursued for therapeutic uh, uh, use, but the study was conducted with lower dose. Um, there, there, there's a no clear, uh, uh, you know, no easy say yes or no. I think it depending on the totality of uh, evidence. Um, you need to consider the result from uh, the lower dose and um, the solubility dissolution data. Um, yeah, and uh, and uh, sometimes you know modeling approach may also you know help to provide some uh, uh, supportive evidence. So it, it will uh, depend on individual situation. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one final question for Dr. Yang, and here's the question. Does the PPI also have an effect on the pH of the upper small intestine? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think we uh, usually think that it won't significantly affect that uh, because uh, the local environment of upper intestine is uh, buffered. Uh, it has a more buffer capacity. 
so this uh, uh, could be a reason to explain some uh, false positive prediction just based uh, on the solubility or dissolution data um, because uh, there might be some drug uh, undissolved in the uh, stomach but later on uh, still got dissolved in the upper intestine. Thank you for answering that group of questions. Moving on to our next panel, we do have a, one more question that came in for Dr. Ramamurthy. And here's the question. Prazole is a common agent in a SIP cocktail DDI study, where it is typically administered as a single dose. Can this evaluation be used as a preliminary analysis of an area effect on investigational drug exposure and can this be used in lieu of a dedicated study if the result is negative? Well, thank you for that question. That's uh, a good question. We recommend pretreatment with a proton pump inhibitors, including omeprazole, for several days, say, for example, four to seven days. Um, this is because to reach the pharmacodynamic study state for these drugs before we can administer the investigational drug. Um, so it, it, it really, it, the study is uh, done also for uh, understanding the worst case scenario. So we do not recommend a single dose study, but rather pretreatment for several days. Thank you. That's all the time we have for questions in this uh, this panel. Thanks so much for the great presentation and answering numerous questions that came in. This takes us right into our next presentation on drug assessment for therapeutic proteins by Dr. Rajan Nayak, policy analyst, guidance and policy team, Office of Clinical Pharmacology and the Office of Translational Sciences in CEDAR, and also joining us, will be Dr. Zhao Lin, a Senior Clinical Pharmacologist, Division of Cardiometabolic and Endocrine Pharmacology, Office of Clinical Pharmacology, and the Office of Translational Sciences, CEDAR. Following this presentation, we'll enter into our final Q&A panel. Please join me to welcome our first presenter, Dr. Nayak. Thank you all for joining us today. My name is Raja Nayak, and I'm here with Dr. Lin Zhao. We're from the Office of Clinical Pharmacology at the FDA, and we will be presenting today's session on drug-drug interaction assessment for therapeutic proteins. For today's agenda, I will present the background of this guidance development for therapeutic protein drug-drug interactions, followed by guidance recommendations regarding DDI mechanisms related to pro-inflammatory cytokines. Next, Lin will present guidance recommendations for DDI mechanisms unrelated to pro-inflammatory cytokines, types of DDI assessment and study design considerations, labeling recommendations, and decision tree for summary. Lastly, we will have a question and answer session with panelists consisting of Elumika, Lin, myself, and Xiaofei. The FDA developed a drug-drug interaction guidance in 2012 in which the nature of therapeutic protein DDIs were addressed. Almost a decade later in January 2020, New FDA guidances were published that addressed in vitro DDI studies and clinical DDI studies. However, therapeutic protein DDIs were not addressed in these guidances. This gap allowed for a new therapeutic protein DDI guidance to be drafted in August 2020 that would supplement the guidances for in vitro and clinical DDI studies. The purpose of this new guidance was to help sponsors of IND applications and applicants of BLAs determine the need for DDI studies for a therapeutic protein by providing recommendations for a systematic risk-based approach based on current scientific knowledge and experience. Earlier this year in June, this therapeutic protein DDI guidance was finalized and published and included considerations and strategies for addressing DDIs for therapeutic proteins. In the years between the publication of the draft guidance in 2020 and the final guidance in 2023, many comments were received on the draft guidance. These comments were reviewed and incorporated into the final guidance, and the following changes were made to the final guidance. FDA review teams should be consulted for novel modalities such as cellular and gene therapies. Clarifications and knowledge related to the therapeutic protein transport interactions were limited. Additions of literature references. 
limiting texts related to antibody drug conjugates due to an ADC draft guidance being published in February 2022, and including language about modeling approaches. Before we begin assessing drug-drug interactions for therapeutic proteins, the first question to address is, what is a therapeutic protein? And a therapeutic protein is defined as any amino acid polymer with more than 40 amino acids in size. Some examples include monoclonal antibodies, antibody drug conjugates, cytokines, enzymes, fusion proteins, growth factors, and hormones. When evaluating the potential for a drug-drug interaction between a TP and small molecules, or between TPs, consider the potential mechanism for the interaction, the disease type and severity, the product type, clearance pathways of the TP, and commonly co-administered medications. Now we will begin addressing guidance recommendations, starting with mechanisms related to pro-inflammatory cytokines. The first mechanism considers when a therapeutic protein is a pro-inflammatory cytokine. Pro-inflammatory cytokines are known to potentially inhibit CYP enzymes, and so evaluating these interactions are clinically relevant. Dedicated clinical DDI data are mostly based on interferon products, with observed inhibition of up to two and a half times for CYP enzyme substrates. The potential mechanisms for interferon inhibition of CYP enzymes includes affecting transcription factors or destabilizing protein structure. Pro-inflammatory cytokines may also inhibit transporters. However, the only available data for pro-inflammatory cytokine transporter DDIs is from animal or in vitro models. And so the clinical relevance of these interactions is unknown. It is recommended that cytokine transporter DDIs are investigated in clinical studies. The second mechanism considers when a therapeutic protein is a pro-inflammatory cytokine modulator. The first scenario is when a therapeutic protein causes an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokine levels. This increase could be transient or persistent. The need and design of the DDI study is informed by the time course and extent of the increase in cytokine levels in clinical studies. An example is clofidumab, which is a bispecific antibody approved in 2023. We have an excerpt of how this interaction is relayed in drug labeling. In section seven of the drug labeling, it is stated that clofidumab causes a release of cytokines that may suppress CYP enzyme activity and therefore increase CYP substrate exposure. Increased exposure of CYP substrates is more likely to occur after the first dose on cycle one day eight and up to 14 days after the first dose on cycle two day one and during and after cytokine release syndrome. The second scenario for this mechanism is when a therapeutic protein modulates pro-inflammatory cytokines in conditions associated with elevated cytokine levels. Levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines differ by disease and the severity of disease. If a therapeutic protein is being developed for multiple indications, the potential for DDI should be evaluated in patients with indications manifesting the most severe inflammatory burden when the clinical DDI study is conducted. In the image below, we have the disease state psoriasis in which elevated cytokines downregulate CYP enzymes and therefore increase CYP substrate exposure. Following biological treatment and disease condition improvement, the exposure of the CYP substrate is normalized to that of healthy subjects. In the event of disease relapse or rebound, re-elevated levels of cytokines result in CYP enzymes inhibition and increased exposure of CYP substrates. There are three main strategies to assess the DDIs for pro-inflammatory cytokine modulator TPs. The first strategy is to provide scientific justification for no DDI potential. Examples of justifications include DDI effects seen with other agents or the same agent in other disease states with similar or more inflammatory burden. The second example is differences in exposure level of sensitive CYP substrates in healthy subjects versus the indicated population considering other covariates. Third example is the magnitude of cytokine modulation by the TP. Going back to the assessment strategies, the second assessment strategy we have is including labeling language that indicates drug-drug interaction potential. The third DDI assessment strategy is conducting DDI evaluation and label based on study results.
The next part of this presentation will be given by Lynn, and she will begin with recommendations for mechanisms unrelated to pro-inflammatory cytokines. Thank you, Rajan. Now I will start my presentation talking about observed or suspected DDIs with therapeutic proteins that are not pro-inflammatory cytokines or cytokine modulators. The mechanisms presented here are not meant to be exhaustive and they may be expanded when emerging data support new DDI mechanisms for therapeutic proteins unrelated to pro-inflammatory cytokine modulation. The first scenario is that a therapeutic protein affects human physiological process and thereby alters the PK of co-administered drugs. A good example for this mechanism is that GLP-1 receptor agonists, such as dalagulotide and albiglutide, result in delayed gastric emptying. For this type of DDI, sponsors should evaluate the potential for a therapeutic protein to affect the rate of absorption of concomitantly administered oral medications. The second type of DDI unrelated to pro-inflammatory cytokines is a concomitantly administered medication impacts the distribution of the therapeutic protein to the site of target or affects target-mediated disposition of the therapeutic protein. Data from animal studies show that antivascular endothelial growth factor monoclonal antibody decreased the distribution of anti-carcinoembryonic antigen monoclonal antibody into colorectal tumor xenografts, supporting that a co-administered drug can impact the distribution of a therapeutic protein to the site of target. For DDI affecting TMDD of a therapeutic protein, a good example is the impact of ibrutinib on PK of rituximab. Published clinical trial data showed that the exposure of rituximab was increased by co-administered ibrutinib. Mean dose normalized rituximab trough serum concentration was two to three fold higher in the first three cycles and then 1.2 to 1.7 fold higher subsequently. The suspected underlying mechanism for this observation is that ibrutinib reduced target of rituximab through inhibiting malignant B cell growth and therefore decreased TMDD of rituximab. In such cases, depending on the role of the therapeutic protein in the DDI, sponsors should evaluate the DDI potential of the therapeutic protein to affect the other drugs or be affected by other drugs. A third scenario is a co-administered therapeutic protein affects another therapeutic protein's interaction with the FCRN and a decreased exposure of the therapeutic protein. This mechanism is supported by data from animal and clinical studies. A study in mice showed that intravenous immunoglobulin therapy increases antibody elimination via saturation of FCRN. In the case of f gortigimod an FCRN blocker approved by FDA in 2021, after receiving the drug for four weeks, mean total IgG level in patients decreased more than 60% from baseline. These data indicate that f gortigimod can decrease exposure of therapies that bind to FCRN and potentially decrease the effectiveness. As a result, the labeling of this drug included language regarding the impact of f mord on medications that bind to FCRN. Last but not least, a concomitantly administered immunosuppressor can alter the PK of a therapeutic protein whose PK is affected by immunogenicity. A well-known example for this mechanism is the impact of mesotrexate on the clearance of adalimumab. 
based on USPI of Humira. In multiple patient populations, the presence of ADA reduced the serum adalimumab concentration. And patients with concomitant treatment of mesotrexate had higher adalimumab concentration than those without mesotrexate. Also, in a prospectively designed clinical trial in rheumatoid arthritis patients, the median adalimumab level in patients concomitantly taking mesotrexate was almost doubled compared to patients on adalimumab only. These data support the hypothesis that co-administration of mesotrexate and immunosuppressant can lower ADA production and therefore reduce the clearance of adalimumab. In such cases, the potential of the other drug to affect the therapeutic protein should be evaluated. This type of DDI evaluation can be difficult to prospectively design, and as such, a descriptive analysis can often be considered adequate. Now I'm going to switch the gear and talk about types of DDI assessments and study design considerations. Using a systemic science-driven approach to evaluate the DDI potential of therapeutic proteins is highly recommended and can involve a combination of assessment types. From a reviewer's perspective, the most informative DDI study is the dedicated clinical study. When designing such a study, here are a few items should be considered. To select the relevant study population, the DDI mechanism and the safety profile of the therapeutic protein should be considered. To decide if the study design should be parallel or crossover, the sponsor should consider the mechanism of the DDI, the PK characteristics of the drug, mainly the drug's half-life, and then the immunogenicity risk of the therapeutic protein. For example, when the effect of other drugs on the therapeutic protein is evaluated, a parallel design might be appropriate if the therapeutic protein has a long half-life. When evaluating the effect of the therapeutic protein on the other drugs, for example, the effect of pro-inflammatory cytokines or cytokine modulators on CYP substrates, a single-sequence crossover design can be used. When designing a study to evaluate the effect of pro-inflammatory cytokine modulation on CYP substrates, the sponsor should determine the time course for cytokine modulation by the therapeutic protein in the specific disease state to guide the timing and the duration of administration of the substrate and the therapeutic protein in the study. Regarding substrate selection, a cocktail approach, which means Simultaneous administration of substrates of multiple CYP enzymes is an efficient way to evaluate the DDI potential for therapeutic proteins where multiple CYPs could be impacted. Another type of assessment is analysis based on population PK model. To make the population PK analysis informative in evaluating the DDI potential of therapeutic proteins, the study needs to have well-designed procedure and protocol, appropriate PK sampling schedule, documentation of the timing of administration, and type of concomitant medications. In general, this approach is used to evaluate the effect of other agents on the investigational therapeutic protein. However, the approach can also be used to evaluate the effect of the investigational therapeutic protein on the substrate of interest if planned prospectively and the data for a substrate collected. Recently, we have seen proposals to assess DDI potential for therapeutic proteins using PBPK modeling approach. PBPK modeling for evaluating DDI potential of a therapeutic protein is an emergent area and it may help understand the underlying mechanism. We encourage the sponsors to talk to FDA early in the development if they plan to use this approach. Another type is assessment based on in vitro testing and animal models. 
in vitro or animal data have not been predictive of the potential for clinical DDIs with therapeutic proteins. However, such data could provide a mechanistic understanding of the DDI potential. To summarize this part, DDI evaluation can involve a com combination of assessments. Sponsors should consider the DDI potential of their therapeutic protein early in the development and summarize their DDI evaluation program at milestone meetings with the FDA. Recently, we have seen proposals to assess DDI potential for therapeutic proteins using PBPK modeling approach. PBPK modeling for evaluating DDI potential of a therapeutic protein is an emerging area and it may help understand the underlying mechanism. We encourage the sponsors to talk to FDA early in the development if they plan to use this approach. Another type is assessment based on in vitro testing and animal models. In vitro or animal data have not been predictive of the potential for clinical DDIs with therapeutic proteins. However, such data could provide a mechanistic understanding of the DDI potential. To summarize this part, DDI evaluation can involve a com combination of assessments. Sponsors should consider the DDI potential of their therapeutic protein early in the development and summarize their DDI evaluation program at milestone meetings with the FDA. Next, I would like to briefly talk about what is expected to be included in the USPI of a therapeutic protein after the DDI risk assessments are conducted. The bottom line is that the USPI must include a summary of essential DDI information needed for the safety, safe and effective use of the drug by the healthcare provider. Regarding how to incorporate such information in the labeling, we refer the sponsors to this CFR document and then the following FDA guidance. Due to the limited time, I will not go through these one by one. By now, Roger and I have covered all sections of the therapeutic protein DDI guidance. To summarize our presentation, I will quickly go over what to do with different type of therapeutic proteins. For therapeutic proteins that are pro-inflammatory cytokine modulators, we generally expect the sponsor include language indicating potential for SIP-mediated drug interactions in the labeling. If the sponsor determines that the potential for clinically significant DDI is low and it's not necessary to include labeling language indicating the potential for a DDI, the sponsor should discuss that with FDA and provide a justification for this determination. Alternatively, sponsors can assess the DDI potential in a clinical study to further inform labeling. The study can be a standalone DDI study or a nested DDI study as part of a larger clinical study in which the primary objective is not to evaluate DDIs. We recommend that DDI evaluation proposals be discussed with the appropriate review division before initiating a study. For therapeutic proteins that are pro-inflammatory cytokines, we recommend that the sponsor assess the DDI risk in a clinical study and then label the findings appropriately. Last but not least, for therapeutic proteins may lead DDI through mechanisms not related to pro-inflammatory cytokine modulation, we recommend that the sponsor evaluate the DDI risk in a clinical study and label the findings appropriately. This is the end of our presentation. Before we start the Q&A session, let's run a quick knowledge check. Our question for the audience is, for what products does the 2023 FDA drug-drug interaction assessment for therapeutic proteins guidance recommend ev evaluating DDI potential? A, pro-inflammatory cytokines. B, 
pro-inflammatory cytokine modulators. C. Therapeutic proteins involved in other mechanisms unrelated to pro-inflammatory cytokines. For example, co-administered therapeutic protein that affects another therapeutic protein's interaction with FCRN. D. All the above. The correct answer is D. Thank you for the great presentation. We'll now transition into our final Q&A panel session. We'll give our panelists an opportunity to connect their mics to refresh the mic settings. And as a reminder to our attendees, if you haven't had a chance to enter your questions into the Q&A chat pod, please do so now. We'll answer as many questions as time allows. We'd like to welcome to the panel Dr. Elamica Fletcher, Policy Lead, Guidance, and Policy Team in the Office of Clinical Pharmacology, Office of Translational Sciences in CEDAR, and Dr. Xiaofei Wang, Pharmacologist, Division of Clinical Evaluation, Office of Therapeutic Products, and the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research. Looks like we have a few questions coming in right now. And the first question will be addressed to Dr. Rajan Anayak. And here is the first question. For pro-inflammatory cytokine modulators, sponsors can provide justification for exclusion of labeling language if the DDI potential is low. Can you share more details about how to decide if the DDI potential is low or not? Thank you, that is a great question. In practice, making this decision will be based on existing knowledge from prior experience or literature. Uh, for example, we can have, or we can decide if the drug-drug interaction potential is low, if we're dealing with a therapeutic area that we have a lot of experience with like rheumatoid arthritis, and if we have evidence of similar types of products not affecting certain interleukins. And so mainly prior experience with similar products and therapeutic areas or literature can be used to decide if an effect is not accept, if, if an effect is not expected uh, due to anticipated low, low DDI potential. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. And moving back up to our first panelist, Dr. Lin Zhao. Here is a question for questions coming in for Dr. Zhao right now. And here's the first question. Have PBPK modeling been accepted for predicting a TPDDI? If not, what are the reasons? Uh, thank you for the great question. So as far as I know, several sponsors have submitted PBPK modeling and the simulation data to assess DDI risk for multiple biospecific T cell engagers. Uh, such as a uh, uh, Belinda tumor map, uh, Teclista map, and so on. But analysis based on PBPK modeling and simulation for these products have not been accepted for predicting TPDDI. Uh, the review team determined that the current PBPK modeling is inadequate to evaluate cytokine related. DDI risk for these uh, protein, uh, these biospecific T cell engagers. And then the main reason is that inflammation is a complex process involving multiple cytokines. And then the current PBPK modeling has been focused on IL 6 only. And in addition, there are limitations for analysis based on IL 6. And I will list a few here. Uh, first, on um, no exposure response relationship between systemic IL-6 levels and then change in C, uh, CYP activities in humans. Uh, next, uh, lack of clinical DDI data for 
model verification. Another one will be unable. We are unable to capture uh, delayed. Uh, my unable to capture delayed suppression by cytokines, and also uh, there are uncertainties about in vitro to in vivo extrapolation of IL six suppression data. Uh, again, this is a uh, air, this, this is an area that requires additional research. If the sponsor plans to use uh, PBPK modeling and the simulation approach to pre predict DDI risk for a therapeutic protein, uh, please uh, discuss with FDA early in the devel development. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have a couple more questions for Dr. And here is the next question. Is it true that the magnitude for TPDDIs is generally small, such that less than twofold change, so we don't need to worry much about TPDDI? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, based on current, currently available data, for pro-inflammatory cytokines and the modulators, uh, the magnitude for DDI may be within twofold, but for some other mechanisms, for example, an FCRN blocker, the magnitude of change in expo drug exposure due to DDI can um, be bigger, as shown in the case of f uh, the case I presented uh, in my presentation, the mechanism of uh, the mag magnitude of change is at least threefold. For this type of change, the sponsor should propose DDI risk mitigation plan. Also, even for a DDI that leads to less than twofold change, if the drug or the drugs affected by the therapeutic protein is a narrow therapeutic window drug, and that the DDI can have still can have clinical implications, and then the sponsor should. Uh, proposed DDI risk mitigation plan. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We do have one final question for Dr. Zhao, and it's the following. What are the special considerations if the sponsor wants to evaluate DDI potential using population PK modeling approach? Uh, thank you for the great question. Uh, when considering the population PK modeling and the simulation approach to assess DDI potential of a therapeutic protein, uh, the most important uh, thing is probably uh, proactive planning. Uh, first, we need to define the purpose of the assessment. Do we want to evaluate the effects of co-medications on TP concentration? or do we want to evaluate the effect of TP on concentrations of coma medications? Uh, in addition, as you all know, data from uh, uh, data for population PK analysis are collected from multiple studies, which are not intended for DDI assessment. And then we need to plan well to ensure all essential PK and then dosing information with good quality for both testing drugs and then co-medications are collected. Also, the population PK uh, DDI analysis plan should clearly specify the objective of the analysis and the critical elements for an informative uh, analysis, such as dosing regimen, patient population, PK sampling schedule, and so on. Uh, careful planning to avoid confounding factors is important. There are uh, different ways to implement population PK approach for TPDDI assessment. And we encourage the sponsor discuss with FDA early uh, if they plan to use this approach. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist, we'd like to welcome Dr. Elamika Fuma Fletcher. And we do have a few questions that came in for Dr. Fletcher, and here is the first question. 
for pro-inflammatory cytokine modula modulator TPs, sponsors have multiple choices to address DDI risk, including labeling, language, scientific justification, or conduct of clinical DDI studies. Why, the recommendation, why is the recommendation different for pro-inflammatory cytokine TPs for which clinical DDI study is warranted? Thank you for the thank you for the question. This is a good question. Um, so we tried to take a risk based approach when we developed this guidance. Um, we heard that in the scenario of pro-inflammatory cytokine modulators, there are a lot of various scenarios that we might want to consider, and those include the disease state. So we offered several options because the disease state becomes very important. And we did have um, several examples of drugs in various disease states where you may expect an effect for that mechanism or situations you would not expect an effect. So keeping those in mind, we gave several options. However, for pro-inflammatory cytokine TPs, that was generally more straightforward. So in the situation where you do have that pro-inflammatory cytokine, you can conduct a study and interpreting that data will not be dependent so much on the disease state or other factors. So that is a straightforward scenario where you can conduct a study and be able to label for it. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We've got a couple more questions that came in for Dr. Fletcher on cytokine modulators. And here is the next question. By pro-inflammatory cytokine modulator type of TP, do you mean TPs that could not only up pro-inflammatory cytokines, but also TPs that could increase pro-inflammatory cytokines? Thank you for that question. Yes, the guidance does highlight two, the two scenarios. One, therapeutic proteins that increase for inflammatory cytokine levels, and the other one where they modulate them in conditions associated with elevated cytokine levels. We've heard a lot about, and we have a lot of experience in those modulators in elevated cytokine levels. However, however, there are situations where pro-inflammatory cytokine levels might increase. Some of that um, can be transient. So we include information really to have you think about whether those elevations are transient and may not result in a DDI effect. However, if it is, if you consider the time course and extent, you might need to conduct a DDI study. Thank you for responding to that question, Dr. Fletcher. We do have one more on pro-inflammatory cytokine modulators. And here's the question. For pro-inflammatory cytokine modulators, should we use in vitro models to assess the potential risk like we have for enzymes and transporters? Thank you for that question. We have a section on in vitro, as um, Dr. Jim mentioned a little ago. Um, right now, we do not have um, some validated methods. And in addition, um, although there are some methods published in literature, at least for the pro-inflammatory cytokines, we do not have information around um, the translation of that information. So that has been a challenge. We do encourage the use of in vitro assessments really to understand various mechanisms if you can assess those mechanisms in vitro. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fletcher, for responding to that question. We do have one more question this round, and here's the question. Currently, there is limited clinical DDI information between TPs and transporters. 
do you have any suggestions regarding how to address this knowledge gap? Thank you. That is um, a current area of um, interest. The guidance did focus a lot on um, SIP enzymes because we do have a lot of um, information and a lot of the cocktails that are available look at SIP substrates. However, it is important that um, we fill the gaps related to transporters and we hope to see more research in this area and that more studies are done in the area. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that group of questions. Moving on to our next panelist, we have a few questions that came in for Dr. Shafei Wang. And here is the first question for Dr. Wang. Although this guidance applies to therapeutic proteins, many of the general principles may be applicable to other biological products, such as novel products regulated by CBER. Are there any examples of where DDI for therapeutic products assessed in the development of CBER products? Thank you for the good question. Yes, although this guidance applies to therapeutic proteins, Many of the general principles may be applicable to other biologic products, including the novel uh, products regulated by SABER. Here I would like to give an example. Thimeric antigen receptor CAR T cells are ge genetically modified T cells. After administration, CAR T cells bind to the target antigen and get uh, activated and start proliferation. Cytokine release syndrome is one of the common adverse events of CAR T cell therapy. Interleukin-6 is one of the most elevated cytokines in cytokine release syndrome. Tocilizumab, an IL-6 receptor antagonist, is one of the medications used in the management of cytokine release syndrome. Here we have a question. Does the usage of tocilizumab impact cellular kinetics of CAR T cells? To address this question, a population PK analysis was conducted to compare the expansion of CAR T cells prior to and after administration of tocilizumab. The analysis results suggest that tocilizumab has minimal impact on the cellular kinetics of CAR T cells. This assures usage of tocilizumab in management of cytokine release syndrome during treatment of CAR T cell products. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We have another question for Dr. Shafei Wang, and here's the question. The development of novel biological products is evolving. Would you please provide some examples of where potential the DDI of, PP, of TP may be considered for CBER products. Yeah, thanks for the question. Yeah, we do see potential DDI of therapeutic proteins to be evaluated in the development of novel biologic products. One example is in certain ther gene therapies. Yeah, uh, the certain gene ex um, gene therapies express or co-express cytokines to achieve or enhance its uh, the drug products, um, the risk benefit profiles. And uh, another example is for certain cytokines or immune modulators have been used with the novel therapies to enhance the um, efficacy or reduce the uh, risks. In these situations, we recommend the investigators to consider potential drug-drug interactions of therapeutic proteins and apply the general principles of this guidance in the evaluation of DDI of uh, in the evaluation of DDI. Yeah. And considering the complexity of novel biologics, the investigators are encouraged to discuss with FDA review teams for detailed recommendations. Thank you. Thank you for responding to those questions. Moving back up to Dr. Alamaika Fuma-Fletcher, we do have a question that just came in. 
And here is the following question. Why can't in vitro or animal models be used to predict TPDDI currently? Thank you for that question. Um, I talked a little bit about in vitro studies. Uh, we are at the similar situation with animal studies where um, for many of the studies, at least for the pro-inflammatory cytokines, the translation from in vitro to in vivo has, is not clear. However, um, we mentioned in the guidance that they can be considered depending on the mechanism and whether the mechanism can be studied in in vitro or in a specific species. So that would need to be discussed with the review division. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Another question just came in for Dr. Lynn Zhao. And here's the question for Dr. Zhao. Are clinical DDI studies required at the time of submission and what implications if clinical DDI studies are not completed prior to submission? Uh, thank you for the question. So as I presented in the decision tree, uh, some of the, depending on the mechanism of uh, DDI, some for some products like the cytokine modulators, we can uh, address the uh, clean DDI risk uh, by this must okay, by by adding. I mean by having a statement regarding the risk in the labeling. Uh, if the sponsor agrees with to that risk, and uh, for some other products, uh, we do recommend. Uh, clin clinical DDI studies, and then we recommend the study to be completed and submitted as part of the BLA. And in the case that the d clinical DDI study has not been completed by the time of submission, what we usually do is we will put something in the label to state, okay, this is this one had this drug has this DDI risk, and uh, uh, and then at the same time we will most likely issue a PMR or PMC. So this is something we definitely need to know, uh, and then we encourage sponsors to submit information earlier. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. There's just a moment to review any other questions that are coming in relevant to the presentation to see if there are any more that uh, that can be answered. So we'll just take a, our attendees a momentary pause to get you to submit those last minute questions and we'll be right back momentarily. Our attendees, just a reminder, we are reviewing questions right now to see if we can answer any questions that are relevant to the presentations. We should be here back just momentarily if we come across any questions that we're able to answer relevant to today's presentations. We'll be right back.
Ah, we just had a question just came in for Dr. Elamica Fuma Fletcher, and here's the question. Can you comment on the role of the change in inflammatory cytokine level in forming the risk of TP-DDI interaction? For example, if there is a cutoff value or a specific cytokine that can be looked into to, to inform the lack of a risk of a TP-DDI interaction. Thank you for that question. We currently don't have any specific cutoff values. Um, especially related to cytokine, we have to consider both the disease state and the actual cytokine and the effect that the class has. So what we're recommending is the use of literature, looking at similar drugs in the class, whether you looked at their labels or other things, to get information about what kind of DDI maybe has been seen. Um, there are several publications from the FDA, from industry and others that highlight clinical examples. So looking at those examples and looking at, let's say in some publications, there's suggestions that there hasn't been an effect seen in rheumatoid arthritis for a certain number of drugs, including those, not sorry, not rheumatoid arthritis, but um, psoriasis, including those where an effect has been seen in rheumatoid arthritis. So having discussions with the appropriate review function around that kind of data and looking at what the cytokines look like for your specific drug, because in some cases, it may be that um, your drug is modulating sp a specific um, um, interleukin. In another case, it may be um, two or three. And then just looking at what that effect is and how it compares to other drugs that have been published is really how you would approach your review division. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. We're going to give our panelists just a few more to review any of the incoming questions, seeing if they can find any ones that are relevant to the presentation. And we'll be back momentarily. We do have one more question that just came in for Dr. Fletcher. And here is the question. Is FDA considering that in the future, AI may be able to robustly determine the DDIs without going into animals or humans? In other words, that recommended studies can be done by AI-generated modeling only. Thank you for the very interesting question. Um, I do not have or have seen um, specifically AI being used for these specific type of DDI studies. The guidance does encourage consider, considerations of modeling 
Um, we have seen Pop PK models being used. We have seen some PBPK being used, although um, there still needs to be a lot of work in that space. So I would say um, FDA is open to different modeling approaches if they do make, um, if they can be used to address the specific question. But at this point, we don't have any experience with AI being used for this particular process. Thank you. Thank you for responding to that question. Do you have one last one last question that came in from Dr. Lin Zhao? And here's the question for Dr. Zhao. Do you recommend to have an independent DDI study protocol or make it a sub study of P2 protocols? Uh, thank you for the great question. Um, from a uh, collecting information perspective, an independent DDI study is most straightforward. And then uh, it, it's any, and on the other, and at the same time, it's easier to, um, man, I mean, to, to manage and get good quality of data as well. But if the sponsors um, design the uh, study, like the, as a sub study, the DDI assessment as a sub study of a phase two protocol, and then they consider all the key elements uh, in evaluating the DDI risk. I we will be open to that as well. Thank you. Thank you so much for the great presentations and answering new questions today that came in. We